Today's guest had no experience in creating or marketing products and then grew her business from zero in 2019 to $5 million in annual revenue in 2022. This interview is jam-packed with advice and stories that can help propel the growth of your business. Are you looking for new ways to make your sales grow? You've tried other podcasts, but they don't seem to know. Harvest the growth potential of your product or service as we share stories and strategies that'll make your competitors nervous. Now, here's the host of the Harvest Growth Podcast, John LeClaire. Welcome back to the show. Today, I'm really excited to have on with us Beth Finbo. She's the founder, inventor, and CEO, and many other titles that she's built this business from scratch. It's called Busy Baby Matt, and you can check it out at busybabymatt.com. Awesome baby product. We were chatting briefly before the show. I have four kids, as many of my listeners know. They're a little bit older, so they're no longer babies, but I would have killed for this. But whether you have kids or know people that do, great gift for others or to bring into your own life. I'll let her describe it and really explain what the product is as we get into this. But you're going to love this interview, I think, to talk about the product, but also her success story, which has been fast and and short. It's, it has only been a few years that she's grown this business into a great success. So we're going to talk about that journey and give some pointers along the way as well. Beth, thank you so much for joining the show today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So first question for our audience sake is what is the busy baby mat and how'd you come up with the idea? <laughs> the busy baby mat is um, really my first invention. We now have a full product line um, and it was a solution that I came up with to a problem after my first son was born. I went out to eat with some of my girlfriends. Um, they brought their one-year-old daughters and the entire meal was spent either stopping the babies from reaching to grab everything on the table or picking up the things that they were given that they then dropped on the floor. One of the moms was a germaphobe, so everything had to get wiped down. And I just, I went on Amazon right away. I was, I was like, I need to get something for my son. So when he's old enough to join us at the table, he won't be that distraction. Uh, and nothing really existed that would be a clean surface for food and keep their toys off the floor. So I came up with the idea for a silicone placemat that suctions to smooth surfaces. And it has a tether system that you can use to hook up baby's toys so they don't end up on the ground over and over and over again. Again, great product. I wish I would have had it, but but we'll definitely get it to some of our, our babies. As I mentioned to you, we've got a, a niece having a baby very soon. So perfect timing for this. And I encourage others to check out the website too. Again, busybabymat.com. Um, so you talked about the product a little bit. Let's talk about your backstory. So you were not always a product inventor, although you've been very, very successful with this business. What did you do before this? Um, so I had none of the skills needed to do this business, literally none of them. Uh, prior to coming up with this idea, I had been in the military for 10 years. I was military intelligence. I did electronic warfare. Uh, and then after the military, I went to school, got some degrees in general business and project management, and then had a corporate job um, doing nothing very exciting. Um, and so it was on my maternity leave from that corporate job that I came up with the idea. And I, you know, people talk a lot about their experience in marketing because your corporate job was in marketing of some sort. Is that correct? Or no? no, I was actually an account manager for a major healthcare company. Oh, okay. um, and I manage the relationship with our Mayo Clinic here in Minnesota. Oh, very cool. Okay. So very, very different from what you're, what you're doing currently. Nothing relatable at all. <laughs> Other than I got really good at Excel, which has helped me in my business. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's got to understand the numbers. So let's talk about numbers for a second. So I, I love this story. So you, your first year was 2019. What month did you launch your actual, the website was live? Yeah, we had um, we had pre-orders that I had taken. I had 100 pre-orders that I had taken over a four-month period that arrived in January of 2019. Then the rest of my inventory came in March. So our first like real push of sales was in March 2019. Got it. And sales were pretty small that first year, but in 2020, your second year of growth, you hit almost a million dollars, just under a million dollars, which is consider that your first year. You know, a lot of times you're you know you're learning, et cetera, in 2019. 220, your your first full year in business. That's phenomenal. And then on top of that, you grew in 2021 to $4 million in sales. And yep. then this year, obviously, we're still in 2022, but you're going to net around or get around $5 million in, in revenues, which is phenomenal. You know, we've talked to a lot of product marketers that had big jumps in revenue in 2020 and maybe 2021. And then if they weren't doing the right things with their marketing, they started to see a decline, whether it's because of 
uh, overseas issues with manufacturing or you know, general supply chain issues, or demand is down, advertising costs are up, all these problems everyone talks about. But I love to see that because, hey, you got a great product and you're managing the business well, it, the proof is that you're continuing, to, you're continuing to grow. So the pace is a little bit slower than you know from year one to year two. That's normal, but still growing, it, it, it's phenomenal. What would you say... What's been one of the keys to the success that has driven this amazing growth of your business over the past three years? Oh, gosh, there's a lot of things. But I think the main key is um, networking. It is meeting people, asking for help, asking questions, being willing to learn, being able to set your ego aside and admit you don't know something and asking somebody who does know um, I, I would say that's if I had to narrow it down to something that's, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, I had no experience doing any of this. I've never developed a product. I've never started a website. I've never manufactured. I've never marketed. Um, so all these things are new to me and I had to ask for help. And so I think asking for help, especially in the areas where you're not knowledgeable or you just don't like uh, the topic, you you have to do that. You have to be able to set your ego aside and say, I need help. You know, I wonder if a lot, again, as I mentioned, a lot of my interviews, I've talked with successful business owners like yourself, a lot of them started out with no experience or at least direct experience with the business they're running currently. And my belief is it goes back to you come into it humble, realizing that, okay, I don't know everything. So I need to, I need to bring in some resources, talk to people and, you know, make this a team effort to some extent along the way, as opposed to some others that, you know, business owners I've talked with that they've been doing this for a long time. And then they start their own business in the same field and they struggle to get along because they do think they know everything, right? They, they, it's hard to get over. And it's that entrepreneurial, you know, you need the energy, confidence, desire, et cetera. But we also need to let ourselves get out of the way sometimes and be humble and realize we need some help. And sometimes coming into a new uh, area like this, a new product, a new business may be helpful for that. Yeah, I think another thing that's difficult as an entrepreneur, especially a first time starting entrepreneur, is in the beginning, you feel like you have to do it all yourself because you don't have the funding, you don't have the experience. You, it's your passion project. You need to burn the candle at both ends. You need to just try to do all the things yourself. It's very hard to spend money, especially in the beginning, to pay someone else to do something. And the thing I've learned is I should have paid the professionals to do some of the things earlier than I did. Um, it probably could have launched my growth even sooner. Sure. And as you said, obviously in the very early days when you're rounding up money, it's it's hard to do. But as soon as you can working with people. And we do that as our business all the time. We bring in experts in different fields that we're not experts in. We've done a lot of product launches over the years, but there's some things we don't do. So working with experts in different fields are, is, is a very helpful endeavor for sure. So what has been the most successful, I guess, let's talk about your first year of growth. So to, let's go back to 2020 where you're, you know, your first full year when you hit almost a million dollars in sales, what was the biggest driver of that initial success in your launch itself? Well, I mean, what a weird year 2020 was, you yeah, know? True. Um, I think I, I did, I did the digital pivot where I went from doing in-person events to doing more online marketing, um, because I was forced to because of the pandemic, but it was also a year of incredible growth for pretty much any e-commerce business because everybody began shopping online. So it's hard to say if it was a com you know, it's obviously a combination of those things. Um, but really it was reaching people where they're at online and, and finding ways to market my product to the new way of life that we were experiencing at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, people weren't going out for a lot of that year. So it's, you know, a great amount of sales, obviously for in-home. And I, I wonder if that was maybe part of the growth the following years, people get, start to get out more and that may be, at least in my life with with babies, that's where you, you feel like you need it more. At home, like if they drop it, you can pick it up. It's a pain. It makes it so much more fun to use your product, right? And avoid the mess. But it's, you know, even more of a need when you're out in public, right? On dirty floors, you don't even know, right? Yeah. It's not your home, your home anymore. Uh, what do you think, what, in your opinion, what drove the big jump in growth then in 2021, the next year? Well, I think it started in 2020 because at the beginning of the year, I had launched a product for use in restaurants. And I was just getting ready to move into retail stores and then all those things shut down. And I was in a moment of crap, what do I do? 
Like I invented this product for restaurants and now no one's going to a restaurant. And I started getting emails and messages from customers about what a lifesaver it was to use to keep their baby busy while they were on a Zoom meeting for work yeah, or while they yeah. were homeschooling their other kids. So I started to see all these other uses for at home and began to just completely shift all of my marketing from you know restaurant use to use in the home and all the different ways you can use it at home. And then we started learning more about how the product helps with baby's development. Um, and so we started just learning and learning and learning more from our customers, what they liked about the product, how they use the product, and then incorporating that into our marketing and helping spread the word. Another reason for the big jump in 21 was also, um, obviously I aired on Shark Tank. So that was a huge you know, marketing moment. Uh, it wasn't as life changing as an experience as I thought it was going to be, but it sure was great sales uh, for a couple weeks there. Have you seen a, a, a lasting effect of that? So obviously there's a big burst of sales that typically comes around a, a Shark Tank hearing. How, how do you think that's helped you since then? I think what, you know, I always get to say as seen on Shark Tank. I, I still do a lot of in-person yeah. events now that we're back to kind of being around each other again. And it shocks me that no one has ever heard of Busy Baby. They're like, oh my gosh, you were on Shark Tank. I love that show. I've seen every episode, but they they don't remember yeah. me. They don't rem Shark Tank was a cool marketing event. And I can always say on I was, you know, seen on Shark Tank. It's a great conversation starter or interesting conversation piece. But more importantly, I've met a network of people who have also been on the show. And so, you know, we have this Facebook group where everybody who's been on the show, we contribute to each other. We give referrals for businesses that we enjoy working with or warnings about businesses we've had bad luck with. Um, yeah. If I have a question about safety testing, I can put that out to the group and someone else in the group will have an answer for me because they've already been through that. Um, so the resources and network of people that I've met from being on the show is probably the biggest um, gain that I've, I had from that experience. Oh, fantastic. So the growth is what everybody on the outside sees, right? Like, oh, that's amazing. Go from you know a million to $5 million in sales <laughs> in a couple of years. And what they sometimes don't realize are the challenges behind it, right? Every business has challenges. What challenges have you faced? Oh my gosh, there's uh, there's all the things I don't know. I didn't know that I needed to know. Yeah. Um, when you have such fast growth, um, you know, having an online business, for example, we'll talk about sales tax. When I sell my products online in Minnesota, I'm only required to, um, to collect and remit Minnesota sales tax. Once I start getting my products in Amazon warehouses, now I'm required to collect and remit in those states. Then once I get reach a certain amount of sales or a certain volume of sales in other states, then I have to collect and remit in those states. And so it's very complicated. It's very expensive to have someone manage that for you um, to know and understand how that works. And I think for a while I put my head in the sand thinking, oh, we don't sell enough to have to worry about that yet. We're not big enough to have to worry about that yet. And then I woke up one day and took a closer look and I was like, oh crap, we are, and we should have been doing this. And so having to go back, pay someone to go through, audit everything, figure out how to fix it, how to pay back those states that we should have been, you know, we lost a little bit of money there. We learned a hard lesson, um, but now we do it correctly. And at the point when we decide to exit the business, those, you know, the books will be straight and we will have done everything right. But I, I didn't know, I didn't know. Sure. And you know, and learning the hard way is never fun. Um, but that's like one example of a challenge is when you grow so fast, there's things that you have to do that you may not fully understand. Um, Absolutely. And, and that's a question I get a lot. You know, we we talk with inventors and entrepreneurs all the time, not just in the podcast, but of course in our, our my day job, right? So in, in working on these product launches and there's a lot of confusion around sales tax. Have you found a good resource that's been helpful for you now that you're kind of over that hump of figuring out the past issues, but something that's been made it simpler for you going forward? Yeah, I mean, we we use an agency that specializes in mm -hmm. it. There's, there's digital um, companies that use automated software to do this. They're very expensive. I actually use one called Sales Tax and More. It's real, real people. Um, and they specialize in staying up to date, specifically only on state taxes and state tax requirements. And um, I found them to be great to work with. 
Well, fantastic. That's a good a great resource to share as well. Mm-hmm. As I understand it, over the years, you've had some copycats come along as well, trying to mm-hmm. copy your product. How has how that fared for you? Uh, so I was expecting, fully expecting the knockoffs to come after I aired on Shark Tank because, yep. I mean, that's just what happens. So I was really shocked when a month before I aired, the first knockoff showed up on Amazon, which I feel like is almost something I could pat myself on the back for because I made a product that was worth copying and it was copied before it was even nationally televised, you know, on a major TV show. Uh, Fortunately, I did take the financial risk of applying for patents and doing a lot of intellectual property work in the early days, which was really, really hard um, because it's expensive. And at that time, I had no idea if my product would work out, if it would be something people would buy, if it would be a success or not. So to spend thousands of dollars on on patent work was not a fun thing to do. It didn't feel great, but you know, it's not a quick process. And fortunately we I have a great patent attorney. We got our first patent through in nine months with no office actions. So I was already wow had a written patent. Um, I joined Amazon's neutral patent evaluation program. I think it's called something else now. Um, and so we were able to take down the copycat. I think we've taken down more than 200 wow. um, different ASINs of not only mats that were almost like exact duplicates of ours, but have tried to design around our patents. Um, we now have nine patents, so it's going to be pretty tricky for, <laughs> for well, we have, we have multiple products now we have, we've gone sure. beyond the mat, but um, in total, we have nine patents. We have one in China, um, and that's so far we've been able to do a good job of of keeping our product front and center and, and getting rid of the the knockoffs. That's great. Congratulations! And that's such a problem with good products, right? It, we you do all the work, come up with the idea, take all the risk, and then these copycats come in, and and it can be so easy, especially if we're not prepared in advance. So good for you for taking that the other risk, right? Of of paying for patents up front, and it you know can be so important to get that as you've proven. It's tough to do after the fact, right? You know, two years yeah. after you launch, it's it gets pretty difficult. But in those early stages, it can really pay off. So that's that's fantastic. Um, I think did you mention you've got a you have a patent in China as well? Yes. How, has that helped you? So on Amazon US, right? A US patent is going to help you here. How has the Chinese patent helped you? It's so we had other factories who started making our our two factories. Um, I'm almost positive they didn't have anything to do with these knockoffs. I, I yep. did see an order through Amazon to China of one of my products that I am assuming was reverse engineered. Um, so having our patent in China, I was able to hire a, a Chinese attorney um, who took my patent to the factory that was creating it. And and in China, it's a different culture. It doesn't work the same way as it does here. We could have gone through a long litigation process or we could threaten them to, if you don't stop, we'll burn down your your facility. Um, that's kind of how it can yeah. work over there sometimes. Um, but we were able to politely um, interact with them and say this this is legitimate and written and enforceable. So we would advise you to stop. At the same time, I got them taken down off of Alibaba multiple times. So when they can't sell an Alibaba, they can't sell an Amazon. There's really no motivation to continue to create the product um, when there's no one to sell it to. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Those become really the the two key sources for almost everything coming from overseas, right. uh, for, at least for consumer products, for sure. That's fantastic. Um, good to hear you've had a success. There's, it can be kind of a mix with with dealing with Chinese patents, from what I've understood. So yeah. kudos to you for making that success. So far, so good. It's a continuous game of whack-a-mole. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it comes with success, unfortunately. So a- another interesting part of your story that that I understand is that your brother now works for you. So yeah. um, you guys are, I think, do you share the same birthday or you're like within a day of each other, uh, four years apart, of course, but. Yep. Yeah. Like We're that. July 9th and 10th. So we've always been pretty close. We, we joined them. Well, I joined the military. Then I convinced my brother to join the military. We served in Iraq together. Um, we went to military training schools in Germany together, which is, is really unusual. Um, and then when we came back to the States, um, we've continued to, to stay close and, and do things together. So when it came time for me, 
when I really needed help with the business, I, I convinced him to quit his very stable job. He also has four kids. He is the sole provider for those four kids. And he had a very um, stable, secure, great job supporting his family with a bright future. And he, he left all of that behind to join me on this very unstable uh, <laughs> adventure of entrepreneurship. <laughs> Again, it speaks to the success you've you've created out of this. I think that's a dream for many people is to be able to help out, but also really work with a, a family member, or a friend, or whatever it might be. And as you create such a successful enterprise, you know they never feel stable, right? We've been running this business for 16 years, and it's it's part of the nature of running a business, right? It never feels stable, even though we've been growing a lot. And you know, same like you, but uh, but yeah. it's you know, great. Kudos to you for making such a successful business along the way. Thank you. It's, so is there uh, is there a resource that's been really helpful for you? You mentioned a couple already on the podcast interview, but is there anything else that comes to mind that has been helpful for you in your business? I mean, there's been so many for me. I think a lot of um, first-time entrepreneurs who are have an idea and want to start a business don't know where to start. There's a lot of people like that. Um, and I found in my area, and I think it's in a lot of areas, is any local um, small business development center, um, the SBDC, the there's a lot of economic um growth kind of you know in in minnesota it's the southern minnesota initiative foundation they're responsible for the economic growth of our our 11 county region and i think there's those places in a lot of states and they have financial resources they have classes um you have to look for those things but there's a lot of them out yeah. there um so i always encourage people who have an idea for a product or a business to look because I didn't know those things existed either. Um, and then as soon as I found one, then I got referred to another one and I keep asking everyone, you know, what else is there that I don't know about that might help? Um, so there's definitely a lot of local resources in a lot of places. Um, and then like I have some resources I've used um, along the way in the form of books and, and podcasts and stuff. Um, there's a, a book called Disciplined Entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a 24 step, roadmap of how to start a business. It's a fantastic book. Bill Allett, A-U-L-E-T is the author of that one. And then for me, this was an accidental business. I want to ultimately exit. I want to sell this business for as much money as I can so I can go on to do other passionate, you know, things I'm passionate about in my life. And there's a book called Exitpreneur by Joe Valley. Um, and it talks about how to position your business for an exit and how to run your business with that exit in mind so that you can maximize the value when you do decide to sell. Um, those are two things. I actually go back to those books quite a bit. Thank you for sharing. I'll, I'll, we'll put the links to those or at least the, the titles, et cetera, in the show notes for anybody who might be driving and listening, can't take notes right now as well. I do want to go back to, I love that you mentioned the classes because that's a part where in the early days, like you talked about, you know, on the day one, you've got no money, right? In, in a business typically, unless you got, you know, VC backing, which our audience is all about, hey, let's do this ourselves and and figure this out, get some investors maybe, right? But But we start small. And and to hire experts to help you with everything in the very early days is on you know on day one is impossible for most yeah. people, but these classes are in almost every market, um, especially in any you know decent sized city. Um, but even a lot of smaller cities will have them. Um, just yeah, take your take uh, Beth's recommendation, search it out in your local area. It's a free way to get started if you're really in your you know infancy with your business, and then as you grow it and can you know have some money coming in, that's where the experts can really help you propel that growth even further. So I'm glad you brought those up and the books as well. As well. We'll put in the yeah. show notes. Another one I want to mention real quickly, if you have any listeners who are military veterans or families of veterans, um, an incredible, incredible resource is called Bunker Labs. Um, it's a nonprofit organization that exists solely to help veterans and their families start businesses, start and grow businesses. And so they offer residence programs, they offer online classes, they offer contests where you can do pitches and earn money. So that's, you know, for me in the early days, I did a lot of business pitches. I won over $100,000 in, in prize money. Um, so that helped get me started, but it all started right there with Bunker Labs, um, teaching me how to start my business and how to apply for these things. Fantastic. Thanks again for sharing that. And I think, you know, you mentioned the, the Shark Tank network as well, which isn't open to everybody, right? You have to be on the show first, but yeah. there's so many more of those like, you know, like a Bunker Labs, or again, if you've got some affinity group that, that you might work for your local area, network and meet with other people to help you along this journey for sure. Well, Beth, is there anything I, I didn't ask in this interview that you think would be helpful for our audience? 
I mean, one thing I like to just ask every every chance I can is, you know, as a small business, like, yes, I may have four or five million in sales, but I still day to day am struggling with cash flow, struggling to market my products and get people to know who we are. Um, ways that people can help support businesses, startups, um, is to interact with us on social media. Um, if you see an ad on Facebook or Instagram, or you see a, a TikTok, or you you know, if we pop up on your feed somewhere, just hit the like button, throw in a comment, share it with a friend, um, because that helps the algorithm, helps our marketing dollars go farther, helps spread the word that our company and our products exist. Uh, thank you for saying that. That's so important. You know, everyone or most people certainly want to help other small businesses out. And that's a great way to do it is by by spreading the message when you find a cool product, realizing that these are not, for the most part, big conglomerates, right? With multi-billions of dollars in revenue and spending behind them. But it's oftentimes the best products, right? The Busy Baby Mat is, is one great example of that. So the way to support Beth and other businesses like her is to, is to check them out and follow them on social media. Thank you for saying that. I, I love that. I do want to tell our audience too, also please go to busybabymat.com. Uh, Beth's been nice enough to share a promo code. You can get a 15% discount. Also be sure to check out harvestgrowth.com to see other episodes we've recorded and if you like this episode and you want to learn more about how you can profitably grow your consumer product business, you can set up a free consultation with one of our product launch experts right on our website. Beth, I really appreciate the time. You've been awesome. This has been a really fun interview. This has been fun. Thank you so much for having me.